My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old. Hello and welcome from St Andrews Cathedral, Sydney, Australia. This is Church at Home. And now we meet together as God's people gathered around his word to pray and sing, be reminded of the assurance we have in Christ and to be taught from God's word. A special welcome today to all the fathers and father figures as Australians celebrate Father's Day. Our prayers are with you. And also for those who on this day, where there's a measure of grief, either because of death and sickness, the tyranny of distance, or the failings of our earthly fathers, be assured of our prayers. And while many of us give thanks today, now we look to our Father in heaven, in whom alone we have his perfect love poured out on us in his son, Jesus. The apostle John wrote, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Now, as God's children, we begin our time in praise, singing of God's love, the hymn, Love Divine. Oh, my God. 
The Bible tells us not to hide our sins from God, our Heavenly Father, but to confess them with a repentant and obedient heart so that we may be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought to admit our sins to God at all times, especially when we come together like this to give thanks for the benefits we have received from him, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his holy word and to ask him to supply whatever we need. With this in mind, let us approach the throne of our gracious God with a true heart in full assurance of faith and pray together. Merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires of our own hearts and have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done and we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who are repentant according to the promises declared to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live godly and obedient lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God and loving Father, we rejoice that you pardon and forgive those who truly repent and sincerely believe your holy gospel. Grant us true repentance and your Holy Spirit that we may live godly, righteous and holy lives and finally come to your eternal glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray the prayer for today. Merciful God, it is by your gift alone that your faithful people offer you true and acceptable service. Grant that we may so faithfully serve you in this life that we fail not finally to obtain your heavenly promises through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we turn to read God's word now, let me pray for us. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. Teach us through your word and equip us for every good work for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first reading is from Psalm 40, verses 1 to 13. I waited patiently for the Lord, he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but my ears you opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is written within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me, for troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This reading is from Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On the ABC Current Affairs program Q&A this week, a panel of Australian elders were asked to share their wisdom. The last question of the night came from a young man who drew attention to the challenges of this year, the pandemic, the economic shock, the global crisis in climate and geopolitical tensions. His question was simple and genuine. What is there to be hopeful about? The journalist said that family and friends and talk and the love of the family gave him hope and happiness. The politician said he was hopeful about growing confidence and economic opportunity for Indigenous people in his state. The Vice-Chancellor said she was hopeful about research and intellectual infrastructure. I wonder how you would have answered the question. Do you have any hope? Of what is it comprised? In the end, Australia's elders did not talk about a deep secret or some hidden pearl. They affirmed ordinary things, so ordinary that you might miss them, family and friends and compassion. And yet the journalist said, am I worried? I'm extremely worried. I guess most people have at least a glimmer of hope that things could be better. Surely we're learning from history. Surely we'll alleviate poverty. Can't we reverse environmental degradation? Aren't we close? to discovering a vaccine. Many people have an optimism that things can be better. Christians have a firm hope, a confident expectation that one day God will make everything right. Dean of St Paul's London, at the beginning of the 20th century, William Ng went so far as to describe Christians as people who were radical optimists, people who believe that evil will be done away with, injustice will be overthrown, the creation will be healed, death destroyed, and people will be reconciled to one another and to God. God's power and authority and rule will establish the good and the true and the beautiful and the just forever. In Jesus' day, the expectation of God's people that God would one day put everything right by his power and authority, that idea was captured in a phrase, a slogan, the kingdom of God. It was a slogan often heard on the lips of Jesus of Nazareth. The kingdom of heaven, God's way, God's day, God's power, God's rule and authority established and expressed in every part of life. Not a place, but a power. Not a domain, but a dynamic. Not a realm, but a reign. And the kingdom remains the hope of Christians today because Jesus taught his followers to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' day, those who heard him, if they had hope for the future, would have expressed that hope in terms of the coming of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. In Matthew 13, Jesus is speaking to the crowds in parables, short, pithy stories that utter hidden things, verse 35 says. The parables were provocative invitations. Do you want to understand? Do you want to know more? Jesus goes into a house in verse 36 and explains the parables to those who will come and learn from him, his disciples. But to the crowds, he speaks of hidden things, the hope that is hidden. Jesus tells two parables about the growth of the kingdom. 
the mustard seed and the yeast. And I want to think about inconceivable growth and comprehensive change. Firstly, inconceivable growth. Verse 31. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Now hear this, if you can, with the ears of those who stood by the Lake of Galilee on that day and listened to the man in the boat. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is his great power and authority, the greatest power and the highest authority. What is it about the kingdom of God that could be remotely like a mustard seed? The mustard seed is indeed one of the smallest seeds, but the mustard plant is not the biggest plant. It might grow to be 10 feet tall. The idea of the tree that has birds nesting in it uh, comes from the Old Testament where it is used to speak of great empires with many peoples within them. And the community that comes into existence through the planting ministry of Jesus is like that. But here, I think the focus is different. The smallness of the beginning is totally out of proportion to the greatness of the end. If you were to look at a mustard seed without any knowledge about it, you wouldn't guess that from that tiny beginning might come a plant 10 feet tall. The power and authority of God is like a thing that begins in a small way and ends up inconceivably enormous. No one could tell the scope and size and effect of the end from the smallness of the beginning. Now look at Jesus, a wandering teacher from Galilee, a man in a boat. He speaks of the kingdom of heaven. He says it has come in him, in his works and in his words. He says that the key to putting everything right is him. But these parables reveal hidden things. How can God's power be operative in this ineffective itinerant preacher and wonder worker? Only if you can't tell the greatness of the end from the smallness of the beginning. The man in the boat, the man on the cross. Consider the gospel message as it is feebly proclaimed around the world down the centuries. Last week we heard from Jesus that his kingdom has an enemy who opposes and divides and deceives. The message was mocked from the beginning. It is mocked today. Without the knowledge of God's purposes, no one could guess what will one day come through the proclamation of this message. I have a friend who serves as a doctor in a country where there are not many Christians or hospitals, but there are lots of refugees and migrants who are far from home and often poor and in great need. Often she cannot help them uh, with their medical problems the way she could if they lived in Australia. She's a stranger to the culture of those people and she's learning their language slowly. It's hard to be there, far from her own family and friends, and sometimes she doesn't know why God doesn't do more. But she visits people in their homes and prays with them and shares stories with them of Jesus and they cry and sing and laugh and talk and pray. She says of a woman whose child is severely disabled, I was sitting on her couch, looking through the red lace curtains at the cityscape of the poor neighborhoods. They talked about God's story and offered to pray for her child. But she said, what's most important is to ask God to show us the truth, the right way. Let's ask him to do that. Amen, amen, my friend writes. Open her eyes, Lord, through your word and through your spirit. She says, another day I left an old man with severe emphysema in my office while I went to the lab. I came back to discover him rummaging through the small copies of the good book there for patients. And he said, I think this might help me. Can I take one? And one for my friend. I said, take three. She tells the story of a woman who has leukemia because she's neither a refugee nor a local and is divorced from an abusive husband and has a small child, she doesn't qualify for any medical help. 
Someone asked me to help. The day I rang, she just prayed, God, no one will help me. Help me. She loves watching the Jesus film, my friend says, but she has just one question. Why did they kill Jesus? This is all so strange to her. May it become sweet and clear. The kingdom of heaven is like a little seed. If you didn't already know, you would never guess what would become of it. And if you want to know about God's kingdom and God's king, then you need to learn the lesson of the mustard seed. You could never guess the greatness of the end from the smallness of the beginnings. And it's not just the cross-cultural worker in a faraway and strange land. All the work of sowing the seed of the gospel is like this. Our generous and gentle scripture teachers as they venture into local schools to share stories of Jesus with children who've never heard them before. Our Bible study groups as we gather together, uh, a few people at home or on Zoom, mugs of coffee, open Bibles, prayer and talk and tears and friendship. If anyone saw it, they would think it was nothing at all. But the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed and you cannot tell what will become of God's gospel, the sowing of the word of God from what it looks like to begin with. Because the light and life and power and truth and beauty and justice and hope of the kingdom will endure forever and the righteous will shine like the sun when everything else everything that seems so impressive and imposing today passes away. Inconceivable growth and comprehensive change. Verse 33, Jesus told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 30 kilograms of flour until it worked all through the dough. The key here is that just a little has a great effect. Just a little yeast leavens the whole lump, as the scriptures say elsewhere. It would have been a puzzling image for Jesus' hearers because as often as not in the Old Testament, yeast was a symbol of evil. And it would have been puzzling that the woman appears to be making about a hundred loaves of bread. Surely those who were standing by the lake that day sniggered when they heard Jesus say, the power of God is like a pinch of yeast. What is going to change the world, its ways and powers? What could change the world so that suffering was abolished and poverty alleviated and disease eradicated and conflict gone forever? What could heal the rift between humans and God? What could cure our hearts of pride and selfishness and the will to power that dominates and destroys and wrecks everything? A mighty power could do that, perhaps. A mighty power like God's power could do that. What image would you use to convey the power and authority of God? The kingdom of heaven is like a mighty crashing thunderstorm, maybe. Or the power of the kingdom is like the raging, terrifying waves of a pounding sea, like a mighty tramping army that carries all that is before it. Jesus says, the power of God is like a pinch of yeast. It's true that the message of Jesus has had a tremendous impact in all kinds of ways. It has borne its fruit in art and literature and music, in education and architecture and government, in the social condition of thousands upon thousands, in hospitals and schools, in the spread of good government and the rule of law and the emancipation of slaves and women and children. But it would be a mistake to think that this fruit of the message of Jesus is the proof of this parable. There's so much more to come. This week, the New South Wales Parliament has been debating the Modern Slavery Act to rid our own state of the scourge of slavery and forced labour and to ensure that our big companies don't unwittingly rely on suppliers and manufacturers overseas who exploit their workforce. William Wilberforce was a man in whom the yeast of the gospel worked in such a way that it affected a nation and nations and thousands of people and the course of history. He entered the British Parliament in 1790, aged 21. He brought anti-slavery bills in 1789, and they were roundly and jeeringly defeated. He brought them again in 1791, and again in 1792, and again in 1794. They were defeated every time. 
He brought them again in 1796 and 1798 and 1799, and they were all defeated. Finally, in 1807, bills relating to human trade on British ships were passed, and he continued his campaign for the abolition of slavery throughout the empire until he resigned from Parliament because of ill health in 1825. And six years later, the abolition of slavery bill was passed in 1833 by an overwhelming majority in both houses, three days before he died. They buried him in Westminster Abbey in recognition of his 45 years of struggle on behalf of African slaves. Wilberforce had written early in his life about the difference between vital, real Christianity and professed nominal Christianity. He said this, the chief difference between them is in the place given to the gospel. Its chief teachings are the corruption of human nature, the atonement of the Saviour, and the transforming influence of the Holy Spirit. I love the story of William Wilberforce because it's the story of how the yeast works. One man who believed the message of Jesus and expected the kingdom tomorrow, and what an impact he had. Sydney has a connection with Wilberforce because he was one of the so-called Clapham sect who lobbied the British government and recommended the first chaplain to the colony, Richard Johnson, who travelled to Sydney with the first fleet. It's an inspiring story, but it would be a mistake to think that Jesus had in mind merely the amazing transformation that the gospel brings about in our lives and the impact that Christians and the church will have on the world in which we live. We shouldn't be content with even the most stirring examples of the transformation of people and society by the gospel, of which there are so many. The thousand pages of Stuart Pig and Robert Linder's two-volume work, Evangelical Christians in Australian History, tells the story, largely overlooked until now, of the broad and deep impact of biblically-minded Christians in the history of Australia since European settlement. My point is, that there is much more to come, much more. And everything that has come so far will pass away. In much of the West, it is already passing away, the Christian legacy. No, the mustard seed of Jesus and his message is yet to become the great tree that will last for eternity. And the yeast of Jesus and his message is yet to influence the whole world. There is still a work to be done of casting the seed of the gospel widely so that it will come to rest in good soil. And one day there will be a new creation because the gospel proclaims that Christ is Lord, the King of God's kingdom. The man in the boat, the man on the cross, the message about him, a pinch of yeast, a mustard seed, you wouldn't guess from what appears today what it will be at the end. Jesus Christ really is the hope of the world. Like mustard seed or a pinch of yeast, if you look around the world today, but in him is God's power and he will change the world. We have a share in that already, much more than the early believers could have guessed. But what we see is nothing compared to what will be. The Lord of the harvest knows what he's doing. He has his purposes and he is accomplishing them. You won't guess that unless you listen to Jesus.
Now let us affirm with Christians across the ages what we believe about God and his love for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to pray now. I will be praying for three things, for um, our fathers, thanking God for our fathers, um, for our missionary Naomi, and for Anglicare and their work. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for our time together each week as a church family. We praise you for continually providing ways for us to meet with each other. We rejoice in you for your unwavering commitment to us, and we marvel at your goodness and grace to us through your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Lord God, it is a great comfort and privilege to call you Father. As we celebrate and remember our fathers on earth this weekend, we thank you for all fathers and all who have been like fathers to us. We are also reminded of those who have had or are having difficult relationships with their fathers or who are grieving the loss of their fathers. Our Father in heaven, please comfort and heal your children who desperately need your love and protection in situations where they do not know what a loving father looks like. May they know you, their perfect and steadfast father in heaven, who will always be there for them. Please please reveal yourself to those who need you. May you use us to show love to those who need it, and may your spirit show us when to act in love and righteousness. Loving God, we delight in the power of your word and your mighty hand that has brought salvation through the Lord Jesus to many nations. We are grateful for your care for one of our missionaries and dear sister, Naomi. We give thanks for reminding her that you are the solid rock on which we all stand, and we ask that those in the land she serves will know the ultimate security of a life built on you. We also thank you for the new opportunity to serve at the center and for giving Naomi a new office and classroom space. Please send more students for her online classes and please help her and her colleagues to prepare well and be a blessing to their students when classes resume on the 14th of September. Father, thank you that Naomi has been progressing in her language learning. Please keep supporting her to maintain her progress, especially in the midst of a busy work schedule. We are delighted that you have given our sister a fun day of playing tourist with a friend. We ask that you will help her to adjust well to the sudden shift in lifestyle 
from leisurely learning to suddenly working. Father, we also ask for your mercy and provide for this country during this current pandemic. Please help them in the limited medical infrastructure and control the current outbreak there. Sovereign God, we look to you during this time of uncertainty as the one true living God that knows all and is acting for the well-being of all. We particularly remember Anglicare workers like Teresa Clark and Bill Farrand, who care for many people that are affected by the loss of jobs and are suffering as a result. We ask for your protection over Anglicare workers and ask that you would sustain them and renew their health, that they may continue in their work. We ask that you also comfort and provide for those who have lost their jobs and businesses and those who are facing financial and emotional crisis. We remember those who have been affected by the bushfires and are now facing more struggles as a result of the pandemic. Please help the church and church leaders to work together to serve those in our wider communities that need financial and emotional support. You have given us all great gifts to uphold each other, and we ask that you will work in your church to do your good works that you have prepared for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Let us pray, as Jesus taught us, we are confident to say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Live for 
eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this week in love to one another and to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.